Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, dear viewers, to another live program, Huda Tonight, and I'm your host for the evening, Junaid Da. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this beautiful opportunity to spread his beautiful deen. And I'd also like to thank all the viewers for their continual support in making this program a success that it is. Brothers and sisters, we have two segments, two fantastic segments. Uh, in segment number two, we're talking about a revert's journey to Islam and his work that he's involved in at the present moment. And in segment number three, we're looking at Islam and education. But let's go back to segment number two and let's introduce our guest who's going to take us through a journey on how he came to Islam. So if I can begin by introducing my guest, um, your name is Samuel Shropshire. That's correct. I pronounced that correctly. And you are the founder of an interesting organization by the name of Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Yes, MVPR. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome you by giving you the greetings. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Brother Samuel, could I begin right from the beginning, going back as many years as possible, <laughs> to tell us how long have you been a Muslim for? I've been a Muslim for, it's close to five years now. I came to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia to work on a project called the Q Project. Okay. It was to uh, interpret the Quran in a contemporary American uh, English to reach another generation of Americans with the truth about Islam. However, uh, I was a Christian at the time, and as I began to work on this project, I had to read the Quran. Okay. I wasn't there to translate because I don't speak fluent Arabic, but I was there to make sure the English was proper. Right. Correct. Okay. So, uh, as I began to read and understand, uh, my eyes were open to the issue of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I understood for the first time uh, a man of mercy and a religion of mercy. SubhanAllah. And uh, could I ask, you mentioned that you were a Christian before, but were you a practicing Christian or? Yes, yes. My mother, you know, people ask me, when did you come to Islam? Well, I, I said al Shahada almost five years ago, but my mother, who was a Baptist, would take me to church when I was only three and four years old. SubhanAllah. And she would take me to the first Baptist church of Jefferson, Georgia, and in that church was a library. And every week she would get a children's book and she would bring it home and read it to me. One book that she got over and over and over again was called The God of Ibrahim or Abraham. Wow. And she told me the story. Abraham's parents used to worship false gods. They worshipped idols. And God told Abraham to leave his parents and to go to a far country that he would show him. And um, she would tell me, Sammy, when you grow up, always worship the God of Abraham. He's the only true God. And I, I stuck to that while I was in junior high school, high school, Christian high school, uh, Christian university, Christian graduate school, always praying and worshiping the God of Abraham. But I didn't know what was Islam. And I didn't know who was the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, until I arrived in, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, about five, year, five, six years ago now. So, mashallah, I can see from... Uh, from your explanation there that your mother's played a heavy role in keeping you good yes, conscious. Yes, yes. She, um, she was a dear woman. And uh, I have no doubt in her mind, in my mind, that had she known what I know today, she would have certainly said al-shahada. SubhanAllah. Very interesting. Um, could I, so w w would it be fair to say then you were a regular churchgoer and you would be active in, in Christianity? Oh, yes. Um, I was also an ordained minister. Wow. So, and I served not in a church as a pastor, but I served in foreign ministries. I was U.S. Director of Christian Solidarity International for many years, which is a human rights organization. Okay. So, I mean, how, what was your initial feeling that uh, uh, when you were told you were going to Saudi Arabia, which is known as a Muslim country <laughs> with Islamic laws, how did you feel about that? Well, you know, I had some nervousness about it, and my friends at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, they said, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> you're putting yourself in harm's way. You're going to get kidnapped. Somebody's going to cut your throat. <laughs> so when I arrived in Saudi Arabia, I was scared to death. Um, I didn't know quite what to expect. But I, when I left the United States, I said, God, uh, my mind is open. I don't know what is Islam. SubhanAllah. I've never been in an Islamic country before. 
And I don't know about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but show me what is truth and what is not truth. And uh, I came with an open mind. My sponsor, Dr. Safi Kaskas, was a great blessing to me. Mm. He brought me there to work with him on this project. And when I arrived, I was afraid to walk on the streets. So I said to Safi, I need to go to a grocery store. Can you can your driver take me? And he says, well, the driver's not available. But he took me to the window and he said, do you see that uh, <laughs> that shop over there? You, have to you can yourself. go there. <laughs> And I said, well, how can I get there? I have to walk on the street. I said, it's dangerous. He, said, he laughed. He said, walk. And I was hungry, so I walked. And I'm looking, looking, nothing happened. People were coming out of their houses when they saw me, <laughs> inviting me into their homes for tea and coffee. SubhanAllah, the exact opposite. Incredible. Mm -hmm. This was not what I expected. Wow. I had been in countries all over the world. I studied in Taiwan, in Russia, and different places. But never in my life have I been in any country that respected me as much as an American and even as a Christian as Saudi Arabia. Wow. SubhanAllah. Showing the manners of Islam in our daily lives. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Rav Samuel, I want to talk uh, more specifically about um, what exactly, uh, when did the penny drop, so to speak, that you were certain about Islam? Huh? I, I became inquisitive. Uh, there were no churches there for me to attend. Um, I wanted to be with people who prayed. And I asked my sponsor, can you take me to a mosque? Because I, from my window at night, from where I was staying, I could see people going in the mosque, coming out of the mosque. I saw people praying, uh, children playing football out in the parking lot. And it looked like a typical American church to me. <laughs> so I said, those people are praying, and they're praying to the God of Abraham. I would like to go and be with them. SubhanAllah. But my sponsor was nervous about this. <laughs> he says, I'm going to take a Christian into a mosque. He didn't know what the response would be. So he didn't say yes or no. He put me off for a while. Finally, I walked to the mosque, and I knocked on the door, and I said, my name is Sam. I'm a Christian from the United States. Is it okay if I come inside? And the Muaddin, Shafiq Zawir, he hugged me wow. and he said, please, come in. And I sat there for three days in the back of the mosque, looking and observing and watching people pray. And then I asked Shafiq, can you teach me to pray like a Muslim? And he taught me the first surah of the Quran, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. <laughs> ah, it was such a blessing. I was memorizing only sounds, but then I would look and I would try to figure out what each sound meant what each word meant, and as I studied it, I saw Arachman Erohim, grace and mercy, forgiveness of sins. Wow. My life was transformed immediately. It was the love of God and the love of the Muslims around me that drew me to Islam. Excellent. A very, very moving, uh, a very moving story, and uh, I'm, I'm lost for words myself. Um, so would it be fair to say that it was in that uh, masjid that you actually took your shahada? No, I, I came to know Islam there. I studied, but it was at the Islamic Education Foundation. Uh, Dr. Sadiq Malki took me there, and I said, I'll shahada there. And I received a card that I was an official Muslim. <laughs> I got in the car and went to Mecca immediately. Wow. And when I saw the Kaaba for the first time, and fell on my knees and my face in prayer. It was there that I was just filled with God's spirit and, and understood the love of Islam, the mercy of Islam for people everywhere. SubhanAllah. And when, when you did uh, go into Mecca and you went into the Kaaba, uh, you mentioned your feelings when you saw the Kaaba itself, but what were your feelings like when you saw people stand for prayer, like thousands of people coming together and following instructions like that? Well, it was, it was uh, in, invigorating. It was, uh, I was enthused in my faith. I was confirmed in my faith by prayer at that time. And uh, it was the first time for me to kneel and pray with other Muslims uh, it was a great experience. 
And also, Brother Sam, you know, it's mentioned uh, in the Bible, you know better than I do, uh, that it, Jesus, he would pray himself. And uh, the description is mentioned that when he would pray, he would put his forehead on the ground. Yes, 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 yes. So how did it feel the first time when you made sujood to Allah? Uh, I, it was like I was living 2,000 years ago in the times of Christ. I see people in tobes. I see uh, people dressed differently from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But it was like going through a time warp, actually, and being feeling in the desert, in the times of Christ, but at home and whole and forgiven and loved. Okay. Very nice. And uh, Rav Samuel, uh, many Christians may see this and see that you've gone astray from the teachings of Jesus and you're following a, an Arab or somebody <laughs> who's far away. But do you feel you are further away from Jesus or you are closer to Jesus? I've never loved Jesus Christ more in my life than I do now as a Muslim. SubhanAllah. I will say this, that uh, my Muslim friends too uh, refer to themselves as followers of Jesus. And this is great experience to see Jesus through the eyes of Islam. Jesus, who is called in the Quran the Christ, the Messiah of God, who is born of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Sometimes Christians will ask me in the United States, it's not the same Jesus. I said, well, how many Jesuses are born <laughs> of virgins? This is the same Jesus Christ. And uh, Christians need to understand what is truly Islam. I was totally misled by what I saw in news reports in the West before I came to Saudi Arabia. What advice would you then give to especially American Christians uh, at this moment in time for, uh, from your experiences? Well, I know that millions of American Christians are taught, as I was taught when I was three and four and five years old, that there's only one God, the God of Ibrahim. And... Uh, we need to worship that one God. It's repeated in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Jesus echoed those words in the New Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And these are the words of Islam as well. Uh, we need to stop and think because Jews, Christians, and Muslims all claim to worship the God of Abraham. We should be talking to one another. We should be uh, interacting with one another so that we better understand each other. It's okay to have differences. There are differences. Of course. But we need to understand those who worship the God of Abraham should have a special love and appreciation for each other. And this very concept of interfaith dialogue, I know you're mm -hmm. uh, involved in that, but we'll come to that in just a few moments. Uh, but I want to ask you some more questions about uh, mm -hmm. uh, your, your journey to Islam before we come over to w what you do. Um, so you embraced Islam, alhamdulillah, and as you've mentioned, it was a very emotional journey. Um, what was the response like when you went back to the States and told your family? This is the surprising part. Uh, I was a Quaker Christian. I never expected, uh, I expected to have some stiff resistance to my becoming a Muslim. Uh, there's actually, uh, the, the Quakers that I'm associated with, okay. they signed a contract with the local uh, Muslim society that Muslims could come and pray in the Quaker meeting hall oh, every Friday for nice. Juma. Okay. So this was unusual. I didn't expect this. I didn't expect to be invited by St. Mary's Catholic Church to come and talk about my journey to Islam. Wow. I, this happened only a few months ago, and I went and I met with the leaders of the church. I spoke. I talked to them about the virgin birth of Jesus in the Quran. Virgin Mary is very important to Catholics. And I talked to them. I read from the Quran about the virgin birth story, wow. the announcement by, uh, by the angel. And it was amazing. Tears in their eyes. Wow. And they would say to me, we never knew this about Islam, that there are two chapters dedicated to the Virgin Mary and her family. And uh, that Jesus is mentioned over a hundred times, Isa, in the Quran. And that Jesus did many miracles, raising people from the dead. That he was a man without sin. 
that he was a man of great uh, compassion, just as described in the Bible, that he was prophet, Messiah, the Christ, that he was raised up to God, and Jesus is coming again. Tomorrow. When I told them, it's, it's impossible. Muslims can't believe this. Tomorrow. You're not telling us the truth. But I was able to communicate that I was telling them the truth. Then they said, uh, can we, where, where can we get a Quran? These are the leaders of the church. I, I had them in the car, but I didn't bring them in. I didn't want to use that as a barrier. But they all followed me out to my car to take Qurans from, from my car. SubhanAllah, and this is you uh, teaching the word of Allah inside the Catholic Church. Inside the Catholic Church. Not only St. Mary's, but St. John's Catholic Church in, in uh, Westminster and different places. I'm invited often, even in evangelical churches, to come and talk about the Jesus of the Muslims. Okay. And uh, have you had any... Uh, anyone uh, wanting to embrace Islam or come close to embracing Islam? Uh, one of my former classmates from Bob Jones Academy came to Islam. Oh, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and uh, there, are, there are others who are seriously considering now, as I planted seeds, I haven't been too aggressive, but uh, we're doing dawah. That's one of the ministries of Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Excellent. Okay. We want people to understand what is Islam. Okay. Excellent. I want to uh, get uh, some of your feelings and emotions with some of the rituals uh, with Islam. Uh, how do you feel when it comes to praying five times a day? Is it, is it a difficult task? Or, or I thought it would be, but I live right near the mosque. I walk there five times a day, or I pray at other mosques when I'm in other parts of the city of Jeddah. And I pray on my own when I'm traveling in my hotel room or in my family's home in Slovakia. Okay. My wife and daughter live in Slovakia, so it's, it hasn't been nearly as difficult. It's only a matter of setting up, uh, establishing uh, a habit to serve God in the way he wants to be served and worshipped. Excellent. And what's, uh, what was your first response, and still to this day, of uh, hearing the recitation of the Holy Quran? Uh, first, let me say the call to prayer sure. from the local mosque. Sure was uh, its music to my ears. It was compelling. It was beautiful, wow. especially when I knew the caller to prayer who brought me, who was instrumental in my coming to Islam, Shafiq Zubir, who was from, uh, his uh, descendant from Rohingyas from Myanmar. Wow. So uh, Shafiq and I are very close. Uh, we, but when I hear the Quran recited, it's, uh, it's miraculous. It's transforming, and I'm very grateful now to be a part of a, of a historic faith that is known for its mercy and not its violence, which is mischaracterized by Western media. Of course, of course. Um, another uh, ritual inside of Islam that every Muslim male and female must perform uh, is the holy month of Ramadan, where we have to fast. Mm. And uh, I had a friend uh, some years yes. back who embraced Islam just a week before Ramadan. And uh, he had the momentous task of fasting for 30 days. He went through shock. <laughs> he went through shock, but he loved it. That was yeah. the amazing thing. Um, what was your response? The first Ramadan was difficult for me. 30 days, sunrise to sunset, no food, no water. I hadn't, my body went through a period of shock. But the next year was easier, the next year was much easier, and now I look forward to Ramadan when I can, you know, fast and worship God in this very important way. Excellent. And not just the fasting, but also the atmosphere in Ramadan. Yeah. Like Muslims coming out, praying together, sitting yeah. together, and how does that feel? Oh, it's incredible. It's, uh, it's, it's like a family time within our mosque. Now my mosque is uh, very helpful to me. They're even building an apartment for me inside the mosque. Really? So I'm very grateful to them for their love and support for me and for Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Excellent. On that note, let's uh, move over to the work that you're involved now. Mashallah, you are uh, giving back to the world, uh, to the Muslims, as well as the non-Muslims in your organization. If I could read out in full, Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Um, could I ask you to just give us an introduction into this beautiful organization? Sure. And you are the founder, correct? That's correct. Yeah. We'll have our first board of directors meeting coming up next week. 
Uh, we're filing for 501c3 recognition, that's nonprofit recognition, with the IRS in the United States. Okay. So we're a new organization, and it's been based upon two years of travel by me looking and fact-finding trips into Myanmar, Bangladesh, and other countries, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Albania. I want to know what Muslims are facing in various parts of the world. Okay. I traveled to Sudan, and uh, I have 35 years' experience in human rights work. Okay. Uh, I asked God, now that I'm Muslim, what am I supposed to do? The Q project, this Quran project is finished. What do you want me to do? And I felt him compelling me. Well, you've got these talents. Of course. You've been working in human rights. Why not continue it in the name of Islam? SubhanAllah. And uh, I started studying this. Islam, human rights. Uh, I found that one of the oldest human rights documents in the world was dictated by the Prophet Muhammad himself. SubhanAllah. It's called the uh, Constitution of Medina, or the Charter of Medina. It guaranteed religious freedom for Christians, Jews, Muslims, and even non-believers inside Medina. Wow. And this came from the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him. We have a great uh, uh, opportunity now, based upon past experiences in working with U.S. Congress, uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, House Committee on Foreign Affairs, with the U.S. State Department, United Nations, and based upon my experience with the British and Canadian parliaments of organizing fact-finding trips okay. uh, into various countries, taking congressmen and members of parliament with me to look at the problems Muslims are facing today and to garner their support in making life better for Muslims around the world. Excellent, very nice there. And uh, Brother Samuel, one of the most, um, uh, I would say one of the most important subjects when it comes to human rights is the Muslims of Palestine, uh, in particular in Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and I know you've been involved in this and you have uh, lots to say on this and I would really like to hear uh, what is your involvement on, in this project? Well, the Palestinians have been, have been repressed and persecuted for many years now, not just Muslims, but also Christians. We had a Christian church in Bethlehem, Baraka Presbyterian Church, came to us, called me on the phone, and wow. said, can, you, can Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation help us? SubhanAllah. So I'll be meeting with the pastor. He's coming to Washington, D.C. the end of this month. We'll meet there. We have attorneys that have pledged to help him. Okay. And we hope the, the Presbyterian Church in Bethlehem, their building was taken. It's being occupied by Israeli soldiers and illegal settlers uh, now, and the church is out on the street. Wow. So uh, it's not just Muslims, but it's also Christians that we're representing around the world uh, to help the issue of religious freedom. Okay, excellent. So with regards to Palestine, what is, your, uh, uh, what is your exact focus? Are you looking at the illegal settlements, or are you looking at it as a whole, or what are you focusing on? Our issue is freedom. Freedom for Palestinians, uh, they've been going through this for uh, since the night, uh, early 60s and 70s, since the Six Day War. The, the country has been, um, has been occupied and uh, there needs to be relief for the Palestinian people as a whole. Okay. We either need to look at a two state solution and if Israel refuses, because less and less Palestinian land is in the hands of Palestinians, then we need to look at a one-state solution where Palestinians have equal citizenship, a secular state where Palestinians own an equal standing with the citizens of Israel. Okay, excellent. And you, you mentioned two possible solutions. And from your experience working uh, in this field, do you find that they're both viable solutions or, or, or is it resistance against both? I am sure there's resistance against both um, because the Zionists want a Jewish state and they want Palestine to be a part of a Jewish state. You can't do that. There will never be, the Palestinians have occupied this land for over a thousand years. They've been there and they deserve, many of them are more genetically Jewish or Semitic than Jews who have been brought from Russia and other parts of the world to live there. Interesting that. So we need to work with all the people who are living there. We have the support of Jewish Voice for Peace. Many people, in the uh, Jews in the United States are anti-Zionist, and they want freedom for Palestine. 
Excellent. They're working very hard for that. So we formed a coalition, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim groups working together on behalf of Palestinians. And uh, if I could ask, have you been yourself to, to Gaza or visited Masjid al-Aqsa or, or any I, of those places? I haven't been in Gaza. In 1971, when I graduated from university, my mother gave me a trip to Palestine as a, as a graduation gift. Wow. And I went to Israel and Palestine. I visited the Holy Land as a Christian. Very soon, I hope to go back as a Muslim and worship at uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Inshallah, very nice. You've prayed in Mecca, you've prayed in Medina, you've got the al Quds left. One more to go. <laughs> One more to go, and inshallah, I ask Allah to make that easy for you as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, so you work with, with Palestine and, and the situation there, but I also understand that you have work and links with what's going on in Burma. Uh, the Muslims of Myanmar can now ask you to talk about that because, you know, um, that situation is, is horrific and uh, the Muslims there are going through a very bad time. The Rohingya Muslims of Myanmar are the most persecuted peoples in the world. Uh, little is said. I find that you know, the darker a person's skin, it appears the less people care. Subhanallah. And uh, it, it's, uh, the dark-skinned Rohingyas are extremely persecuted. Their villages are invaded by Buddhist extremists. They're torched, they're burned. People are lined up and in groups and burned to death by the hundreds, and uh, yet the world pays little attention. The Rohingyas are trying to escape, so they get on boats and they go to Malaysia and different countries in the in uh, in south of the south of Burma or Myanmar. Uh, many escape through the jungles into Bangladesh. I've been to two refugee camps in Bangladesh. 60,000, 30,000 in each United Nations refugee camp. SubhanAllah. And these people have been there for 30 years in a refugee camp. Wow. This is no future, this is no hope. There were 240,000 Rohingyas living on the streets outside the refugee camp. And you little children coming to me and saying, uh, uh, Mister, you want massage? And I didn't know how to respond to that. I asked the the attorney who was with me, who was from uh, the capital of Bangladesh, and I said, w what are they asking? And he said, these children are child prostitutes. These are the children of Muslims whose parents died trying to get there. And the children are living on the streets and trying to survive. What can we do to help these people? And Islam, Muslims, we cannot be silent when our people are suffering like this. We have to respond. Saudi Arabia has responded. We have over uh, close to 400,000 Rohingyas living in Saudi Arabia now, refugees. And, uh, but more can be done, and we need to respond with compassion and with the mercy of Islam. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Brother Samuel, what, what would you say is um, uh, some of the ways in which we can help? I mean, uh, this is an opportunity, our voice is going out to, to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people all across Africa, the Arab world, and over, even into Europe and America. Uh, what would you say uh, Muslims need to do? Um, there are a number of Islamic organizations providing relief and development, uh, also through the United Nations. Uh, we can respond generously and sacrificially with our money to help refugees. There are over 60 million refugees in the world today. The majority of them are Muslim. Okay. This is more refugees than any time since World War II. And uh, we, their brothers, we brothers and sisters to these people need to love them and care for them and to express our solidarity with them. Okay. Very nice. Um, also, brother, could I ask you to uh, let's take the let's take the situation now back home. Um, I, I mean, I come from London, and you come from the states, and I see these days that uh, the rise of Islamophobia, the rise of hate crimes against Muslims, is on the ever increase. Uh, would you share that sentiment with me? And if so, why is that the case? In the U.S. right now, we're in the middle of a presidential campaign, and one of the Demo uh, Republican presidential candidates is praying, uh, uh, playing on the fear and the hatred, uh, xenophobia, and the Islamophobia of the people. Uh, he has massive support amongst the Republican voters. 
He is leading in his campaign for Demo uh, the Republican primary candidate for president of the United States. His name is Donald Trump. Um, I want to say he doesn't have a chance of ever being president of the United States. The majority of the American people will reject him. But then people said that about Hitler as well in Germany. Well, so uh, we need to be cautious. We need to be aware. And these extremist candidates inflame uh, hatred and uh, they inflame uh, Islamophobia expressing this, these extremist views in order to get the votes of other extremists. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, Samuel, we're approaching the end of the program and uh, we've got just under a minute. And in these 30 seconds to a minute, could I ask you to just give us some words of advice um, from yourself to the Muslim world at large in how we can um, rectify our situation? Well, we can make a difference. Uh, we need to understand that even in the face of opposition, in the face of people burning Korans, in the face of uh, extremist positions being taken against Muslims in various parts of the world, that we respond with the love and compassion of our prophet uh, who was persecuted himself and never swung his fist. He was stoned and he never picked up a rock and threw it back. He never cursed. He never swore, even when he was... Uh, when someone attempted to poison him. Uh, he was a man of great mercy and kindness. It was that love and that great kindness and mercy that brought me to Islam. There are millions of people waiting for this love. And Islam needs to be known for what it was originally, not uh, extremism and terrorism. I'm convinced now that 10% of people in all religions, whether it's Christian, Muslim, or Jewish, are fanatics and a little bit crazy. Okay. Maybe a whole lot crazy. And they, they present this hostility. Uh, this is not Islam. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Samuel. We have come towards the end of the program. And uh, I, myself, in this hour, have been on a roller coaster of emotions. Um, but uh, I'm very pleased and I'm very honored to have spent this time with you. And uh, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the strength to continue with your work and for you to make a massive impact in this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be uh, here with you this evening and to be able to share with your audience about what Allah, God, has done in my life, the tremendous changes that have taken place. Thank you very much. I'm sure the pleasure is ours. Abraham, on that point, I would like to conclude and uh, conclude by saying assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dear viewers, we've come to the end of segment number two here on Huda tonight. SubhanAllah, what can I say? My words cannot summarize the feelings and the emotions uh, that we both went through in this hour, looking at Brother Samuel's journey to Islam and how his mother played a vital part in him coming to Islam, SubhanAllah. And then look at that five years into Islam and he is working passionately with all his energy, looking at the Muslims of Burma, the Muslims of Palestine, the Muslims all over the place. And yet we as born Muslims, what have we done? What effort have we done to rectify the affairs of the Ummah? What is our contribution? My dear brothers and sisters, we're going to take a very short break. And in this break, I want every single person to sit down and to think about their contribution to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu if, if you don't have much to respond to that, you need to make some changes in your life. So we'll take a very short break here and then join me in segment number three. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.